Oh. Uh-huh. 
presents. Hallelujah. When I think about the
This morning, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer together. Some of you know, and some of you know. You know, God doesn't care how you pronounce those names, and some of them are important, some of them aren't, but I'll give you the ones that are important for all of us. So let's look at Genesis chapter 14, starting in verse number 1. At that time, when Amphrapil was king of Shinar, Ariot king of Elisar, Kindlerbar king of Elam, and Tidal king of Goyu, these kings went to war against Barak king of Sodom, Bersha king of Gomorrah, Shinab king of Adma, Shemabar king of Zeboim, and king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these latter kings joined forces in the valley of Sidon, that is the Dead Sea Valley. For 12 years they had been subject to Ketelamar, for but the 13th year they rebelled against him. So here we see there were four kings that had charge over these other five kings. So the four kings were in charge of five kings or five kingdoms. Now guys, the kingdoms in that day were not like hundreds of thousands of people. We're talking uh, in the thousand range was a kingdom of that size because we're still pretty close to when God scattered them out over the face of the earth and people are still multiplying upon the face of the earth. So here we see that four kings were over five kings and they were paying uh, royalties to the four kings every year. They did this for 12 years, but in the 13th year, they rebelled against Kindulamar. How many of y'all can pronounce Kindulamar? I would ask you to spell it, but if you can't spell it, then you'd be pretty dumb because it's up on the screen. In the 14th year, Kindulamar and the kings allied with him went out and defeated the Raphaites and the Sheriff Karnan, the Zuzites in Ham, the Emites in Shabbat, Karathim, and the Horites in the hill country of Zaire, as far as El Paran near the desert. Well, everybody knows that's near the desert. Come on. Then they turned back and went to in Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and they conquered the whole territory of the Amalekites, as well as the Amorites who were living in Hezanan Tamar. So then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zebulun, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Sidon. So here we see that the four kings, after those who were subject to them, had started saying, we're not paying you tribute anymore. They went out and started conquering those lands, those four kings. And now we're getting to the point in time where those five kings that were paying subjects were now going to face the four kings. Everybody's still with me. So the five kings, which is part of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zebulun, and Zoar, were going up against the four kings. Kendalmar, Tidal, Amraphel, and Ariok. Everybody should know the story. <laughs> Be able to quote. Now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits. And when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fell into them and the rest fled into the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. And then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshkel and Anar, all of whom were alive with Abram. So Abram had these other guys behind him. And when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Kindlebar and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shabbat, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. 
he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed by it be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my man have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me to Anar, Eshkel, and Mamre. Let them have their share. So here we see a great story of what takes place in that day of someone who came and was a rescuer. And that's why I want to title today's message and talk about Abram to the rescue. Abraham, Abram to the rescue. Everybody knows that kid or that family member who is always getting in trouble and someone's always having to go and bail them out trouble get them out of situations they don't it's like Dennis the menace is just constantly always getting in trouble and getting themselves in situations and you're either that older sister or that parent or that friend who has to go and get that kid out of trouble some of y'all were the ones who helped get those kids out of trouble who went and bailed them out when they were in trouble and needed somebody to go and get them some of y'all were that kid that was getting mailed out there's a wide range that goes in there but this is the story about what abram was uncle abram was to his nephew lot his nephew Lot had gotten into trouble because he made some bad decisions. And as we'll see this morning, those things matter. And as we look at it closely, we'll see the difference in Abraham's life compared to Lot and how we can apply that to our lives where we're, we will be blessed by God Almighty. The first thing I want to talk about is this. Why did Abraham have to come to the rescue? We're titled it, Abram to the Rescue. Why did Abram have to come to the rescue? Abram had to rescue Lot because of Lot's bad decisions. Lot made some bad and poor decisions. You'll remember last week we were just talking about how Abram and Lot were together at this time. And they were talking about how the land was not big enough for both of them. And Abraham said to his nephew Lot, listen, look to the north, south, east, or west. Whichever way you want to go, you choose it and you go that way. Take all of your possessions and go. And I will choose and go the other way. And the Bible says in Genesis 13, verse 11, So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain. And notice this, and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Lot chose to go in this direction. And I talked about how it's not always better that the grass isn't always greener on the other side, even though it is. And Lot chose to go this way. And he chose to go near the city that was evil, that was doing wicked and evil things in the sight of the Lord, sinning greatly before the Lord. Lot chose to go towards that way. But notice something it says there. He pitched his tents near Sodom. It was near Sodom. He wasn't going to go into the city where evil and everything abound. But what do we see this week? Look at verse number 12 of Genesis chapter 14. This is after the four kings came in to that area. It said they also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living where? In Sodom. Over the course of a few verses, we see the general progression of Lot, Abram's nephew, about decisions that 
he made that led him to the situation that he was in. He was living in Sodom, whereas just a chapter before, he was living on the outskirts of Sodom with his tents pitched towards that way. Lot probably thought to himself, I can handle it. I can handle it. I'm the exception to the rule. Wickedness and sin will not affect me. I can take it. The devil ain't got nothing on me. The church, let me preface this by saying, Satan has nothing on you. But it also doesn't mean that we go picking a fight with the devil. Don't worry about it. Satan knows where you are. He can find you and you will battle him. But we don't go looking for a battle with the enemy. We're victorious in all things. But we've got to be smart about things as well. We don't put ourselves into situations that can compromise our witness for the gospel of Christ. Lot said, I'm going to be a great witness to those evil pagans there in Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know what he made? He was a godly person because as we'll find out later on, he was spared from Sodom and Gomorrah. But you also see the extent of the sinfulness of the impact that Sodom and Gomorrah had on his life as we'll get into. I don't want to, I don't want you to uh, not know what's going to happen, but I want to give you a little tidbit on that. Lot thought he could handle it. Church, always make sure, I'd like you to write this down if you would, always make sure you witness, always make sure your witness for Christ affects them more than their witness of the world infects you. Notice what it said there? Always make sure your witness for Christ affects other people, affects them more than their witness of the world infects you. Because sin infects. Sin will come in and steal, kill, and destroy. The gospel of Jesus Christ, though, is able to go in and give freedom and give victory. But there's a problem when the effects of the people we're going to minister to are having greater impact on us than the message of Jesus Christ within our lives is having on them. I don't believe we have to be afraid and just cover our eyes and say, whatever happens, whatever happens. I believe in going, seeking, and saving those who are lost, compelling them to come in. But there's a fine line between compelling them to come in and getting caught in the trap that they are caught in. And in essence, it's like a spider web that gets us caught and we just get drawn in more and more as the progression we see in Lot's life, he pitched his tents near Sodom. Then we find his life was inside the city. It's a progression. Your decisions not only impact you, but they impact other people. Lot's decision impacted not just him. Lot's decision impacted his family. But it, it didn't just impact his immediate family. It impacted Abram. Now remember, Abram went in the opposite direction. But all of a sudden, he gets word because this messenger was able to break away from the war and was able to go and get Uncle Abram and said, Hey, your nephew Lot is in trouble. He's been taken away with all the possessions. Abram's probably just kicking back, drinking a soda, just taking in the lot. Here all of a sudden we see that his little nephew Lot is in trouble again. And Uncle, I almost said Uncle Ahab, Uncle a Abram has to go and save the day. This past week, uh, uh, actually it was Thursday, I had just gotten done delivering meals on wheels and I was going home and taking a nap because I don't think we slept at all the night before. Aubrey had one of those nights and she was kicking, screaming, all this stuff. So I was going home to take a nap that I wasn't telling Linda about. And I'm going home. And all of a sudden my phone rings about 20 minutes after I take a nap. And when I take a nap, I take a nap for at least an hour. And my phone rings. And guess who it is? 
I looked down and the caller ID said that it's Tiffany Messer, our children's pastor. And I'm going, okay, so I pick up the phone, hello. And it's Rowan on the other end of the line. They called me up and said, Pastor Joe, are you at the house? I go, yes, I'm at the house. What's going on? Uh, uh, we have a flat tire and uh, we're on MacArthur here about 311. Uh, could you uh, help? Yes, I'll be there. I said, do you have a spare? He said, yeah, we have a spare. I go, do you have a, a lug nut wrench? And he said, yeah, we have a lug nut. Do you have a jack? No. <laughs> we don't have a jack. How do you not have a jack? You have the four square lug nut wrench. You have the spare, but you don't have a jack. The decision to not put the jack in your trunk not just affected you, it impacted me. <laughs> you made a bad choice, and your bad choice not just affected you, it affected me. I had to get up from my nap. And it didn't just affect me, it affected everybody that came in contact with me the rest of that day. Why? Because I didn't get my full nap. You see how decisions matter? So what did I do? I got up and I took the jack and I took uh, the, uh, what do you recall that jack, the jack thing? Uh, hand, the handle. <laughs> I took the mechanism that made it go up and down and took it over there and we changed the tire and they were good. But it also shows how little things can impact bigger things. The point of all of this is that Lot made bad decisions and that's why Abram had to end up going and rescuing him. If Lot would have made better decisions, he wouldn't have found himself in that place. There's another principle there that I don't have time to go into, but I'll share it with you is, the point is, choose who you go to battle with carefully. Do you notice how Lot was defeated? Why? Because he aligned himself with the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah. Know who you align yourself with. Not so much as who you go to battle with will impact your life. The friends you hang around, your co-workers that your buddy buddies with, your bait that you choose for life, they will impact your life exponentially. Choose who you go to battle with carefully. Your choices matter. Secondly, Abram's response to God's faithfulness. We see Abram's response to God's faithfulness in chapter 14 and verse number 18. Now the three verses that I'm about to read are kind of set apart. It's two different scenarios are going on. Remember that, Ab uh, that Abram had gone into battle with 318 men and they split up and they defeated the men, the four kings. And they were bringing back everybody and bringing them back to where they were. And we see that the king of Sodom was going out to meet Abram. But we also see a transaction here that takes place between Melchizedek, who was the priest of God Most High, and he was known as the king of Salem. And there was no mention of Salem before. So chances are it was a small town where he was God of the Most High. And we'll get into that in a moment. But verse 18 says this scenario with Abram. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram, be God Most High creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God, most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. 
We see that Melchizedek is a high priest to God and he's coming to minister to Abram. He was a leader of the people. Melchizedek is mentioned not just here in the Bible, but in Psalms and in Hebrews, where it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. There's a comparison made of Melchizedek, Hebrews 6, 19. It says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of who? Melchizedek. I just wanted to hear somebody else say that name. Melchizedek. What did Melchizedek do to Abram? Melchizedek ministered to Abram. How did he minister to Abram? He brought out bread and wine to feed him and to minister to him. When he was out at battle the whole time, they didn't take time to stop, drink, and eat. What were they doing? They were hightailing it there to rescue Lot and all of the possessions of the land. That was their motive. That was their goal. So when they're coming back with all of the ones who have been taken away, with all of their possessions, they're heading back to the land. We see that Melchizedek goes out and ministers to Abram and the men by bringing them food and drink. As a minister of the gospel, I am to minister to people continually by feeding them the word of God and providing life-giving drink that those who drink of it, they will never thirst again. As a minister of the gospel, that's one of the fundamental things with which we do and how we minister to others. That's what Melchizedek did. Something else Melchizedek did is he blessed Abram. He blessed Abram. To bless means to proclaim God's favor upon them. And that's what Melchizedek did. Blessed be thou, Abram, God of the Most High. He blessed him. I proclaim God's favor over you every single day. As a minister, one of my fundamental things is to bless you. And I bless you by proclaiming God's favor over you from God's word. The blessings of God's word is God's favor. And as a minister, I'm called to proclaim God's favor. So here we see Melchizedek. He blessed Abram, and he also ministered to him. And the response of Abram to God's faithfulness within his life is something that we see the first action of within the Bible. And it says, Abram then gave a tenth of everything he had to Melchizedek. Pastor Joe, where do we see the beginning of tithing within the Bible? We see it right here in chapter 14 of Genesis. Now, I've heard many people say, Pastor Joe, this tithing thing, that's all Old Testament. You know what? Tithing is mentioned a lot in the Old Testament. But do you know that tithing was mentioned, or people will say, that's all in the law, and we're not under law anymore. We're under grace, peace, and mercy. Can I remind you, the law is not being given at this time. The law is not given until after Moses leads the people out of Egypt. But here we see that Abraham, out of his heart, knew that he was to give a tenth of everything he had to Melchizedek. This was the first recorded time that this had happened. We'd also seen offerings given to the Lord by Cain and Abel. But some people say, well, Pastor Joe, I don't care if it was not under the law. That's still Old Testament. You do not see tithing talked about in the New Testament. Well, let me show you this. It's Jesus' words. Matthew 23, 23 says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. So who's Jesus talking to? The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the ones who are prim and proper and have everything together, so to say. It says, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. 
So here we see that Jesus mentions tithing, but in this impact of this scripture, it looks like he's denouncing it or he's speaking bad of it or that tithing is evil. It looks like that if you don't read the rest of the message. What does the rest of the verse say? You neglect those things, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. What does Jesus say to them? You should have practiced the ladder. What is the ladder? Not something you climb up and down on. What is the ladder here in this verse? You gave a tenth, a tithe. You should have practiced the tithe without neglecting the former. What was the former? Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. So Jesus doesn't denounce the tithe. Jesus says, you should have practiced this, but beyond this, you should have been doing and not neglecting the more important things. Church, can I tell you, I believe the Bible teaches tithing. I believe that that's what it proclaims. And that, I believe, is a minimum of my giving is a tenth of what I bring in. The Bible teaches tithing. That is why our family practices tithing. There's every month. We get, Glenda gets paid once a month. I get paid here once a week. Now, my check here goes to the district office. I pay a tithe of my minister's dues to my ministry organization that I'm a part of. Everything else, or if I mow a yard, if I do this or that, or Glenda gets an extra check, everything else we write 10% of that, it goes to church. Why? Because I believe the Bible promotes and asks us to tithe. Why do I tithe to this church? Why should I ask you to tithe to this church? Or why all of these preachers are asking for money? Where do I know where to give? I don't give anything because I just don't know where to give because I have no idea. Where should you pay your tithe? Notice where Abram paid his tithe. Abram paid his tithe to whoever ministered to him. Who ministered to him? Melchizedek. He brought out the bread and the wine. He fed him. Church, where should you support ministry? Your church, your support belongs to wherever you're being ministered to. Amen. And can I say, if you aren't being ministered here, don't pay your tithe here. But if you aren't being ministered here, then let me ask you another question. Why are you going here? Find you someplace where you're ministered to by the word of God. Let it give you life. Let it speak into your life. That is where your tithe belongs, is where you receive your ministry. But also, don't go to this church and pay your tithe somewhere else. Uh-oh. Getting now, Man, that might be the quietest y'all ever been in here. The church, I, well, what if I'm a shut-in and I'm unable to get out and go anywhere? You know what? I'm okay with you sending your tithe to wherever you're ministered to. Where do you receive ministry from? And if there's a preacher on TV that just ministers to your heart and you receive that fellowship that you would normally receive by coming and meeting together here, you know what? I have no problem with that. Why? Because I believe there's a principle of tithing. You tithe where you are ministered to. Well, Pastor Joe, I'm home sometimes. I'm, I'm here sometimes. What do I do? There's some people here that are living here half the time and living somewhere else half the time. So what they do, they tithe there and they tithe here. Why? Because they receive ministry there and they receive ministry here. And that's what they do. And I believe that's a principle that we see throughout God's word. Wherever you receive ministry, that's where your tithe belongs. Now, I'm not so stern in thinking that I, you'll only give money here. I give money to other ministries. We support four missionaries every month, Glenda and I, on our own, because we believe and know the importance of what it is to give and to support the ministry of Jesus Christ. And I'm amazed at how God has provided for that. 
Church, this isn't something I'm telling you to do because I want you to do it or we need the money. No, we need God's blessings within our lives and God's blessings come about because of obedience to him. If you don't think that's right, go to another church, receive ministry from them, give them your tithe, and you'll see the effects of ministry and the obedience to God's word. Do you still love Pastor Joe? Yeah. Oh, dear heavens. <laughs> Do you still love Pastor Joe? Can you at least tolerate me for a few more minutes? Okay. I'll take that. If you can't win it all, you might as well win it some. Point number three, and lastly, Abraham recognized where true blessing and provision came from or comes from. Now remember those three verses we read just a few moments ago about Melchizedek and what was going on and happening there where Melchizedek brought out the bread and wine and blessed Abram. We see that Abram gave him 10% of everything that they had just taken. All the spoils, everything. He gave Melchizedek 10%. And remember the king of Sodom's coming out to meet Abram, the one who went and rescued his people. Where was the king of Sodom all this time? That's a good question to ask. But we see that the king of Sodom is going out to meet this man named Abram who rescued him. And he's probably going out there and saying, hey, I'm going to do something good for this guy. Watch this. Verse 21. The king of Sodom said to Abram, just give me the people. Keep all the goods for yourself. And I can just imagine the king of Sodom thinking, I'm going to bless Abram. I'm going to show him how appreciative I am of what he just did. But notice the response of Abram. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn on oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you not even a thread or a strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, Aner, Eshel, and Mamre. Let them have their share. So what is Abram saying to the king of Sodom? Listen, buddy, I don't want to have anything to do with you. You are not who I am going to receive my blessing from. My blessing comes from the Lord. I will not receive blessing from evil men. You are trying to bless me. You're trying to make me rich. You are not the one who establishes and provides for me. You are not the one who brings true blessing in my life. Abraham recognized true blessing and provision comes from God. And tithing church is more than just a response to God's faithfulness. It's recognizing where true blessing and provision truly come from. Our gain does not come from evil men. Sodom was evil and represented everything that was wicked in this world. And Abram declared that no one would say he got rich by anyone like the king of Sodom. Now here's the litmus test. How many of us will be able to turn down blessing and riches no matter who the source was? Church, the source matters. The source of the blessing matters. Why? Because how many of y'all have seen over the years, you've seen it in time and time again, where money, where fame corrupts, and it shadows, or it, keep, it might just tweak something a little bit. Somebody will bribe you or give you favors this time, and then they'll wait until the moment that they need something from you. And it's something big. They're calculated. And that's how blessings can be in the world. But the source of blessing and the source of provision matters. Look at one last scripture reference. How many of y'all have ever heard of the unpardonable sin? The sin that can't be forgiven. There is a sin that can't be forgiven. We're going to look at it here. It's when Jesus is talking, so it's a pretty good reference. 
Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. And he's, Jesus had just got done healing this boy. Instantly, miraculously healed in the earlier part of Matthew chapter 12. And this is his discourse with the Pharisees again. This is what's going on. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. So many people have differing opinions about this. Well, many people are wrong. I'm the only one who has the right opinion on this, and I'm about to share it with you. That's kind of sarcastic, but kind of unsarcastic. I understand what Jesus is talking about here. Now, if you just read this, when you, I love it. When I was a Pentecostal kid growing up in high school, there were some kids that would make fun of us because we were Pentecostal. And I'd always throw this verse out at them. Listen, don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit or you won't be forgiven. You know, let's spend eternity in hell for doing that. And that kind of gives you a little bit of clout. But that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about somebody making fun, somebody who speaks in tongues or making fun of the Holy Spirit. What it's talking about is, what was it doing earlier? We see that no, Jesus didn't address the comments to his disciples or the crowd. Who does he talk to? He specifically talks to the Pharisees who had personally witnessed the miracle of completely and instantly healing a blind and mute demon-possessed man. And what did they do? Rather than acknowledging the obvious fact that Jesus was the divine power and the healer, the Pharisees were so spiritually depraved that they attributed his power to Satan. And church, notice what they did. They attributed the powers of God. They attributed them to Satan. The unpardonable sin within your life and mine is when we attribute the works of God to the works of Satan himself. How can you and I be saved if we do not acknowledge the Holy Spirit and the convicting power that comes through him? There is no possibility of being saved unless we receive the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. None of us can be saved unless we accept that gift. So the unpardonable sin is unpardonable. If you reject the message of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, you will be damned to hell. Why? Because there's no other way to heaven besides through Jesus Christ and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that draws us to Christ. Jesus didn't say, oh, what? how many people over the years have come up, I think I've committed the unpardonable sin. If you think you've committed the unpardonable sin, you haven't committed the unpardonable sin. Because anybody who's committed the unpardonable sin has no willingness or any thought whatsoever to the things of God. Now, do I believe that God is able to save anybody? Yes, I do. And I don't believe there's a person living right now that doesn't have the possibility of being saved. But I believe also that there are people in this life who have made it their decision to not have anything to do with Jesus or God's message whatsoever, no matter what. And they are living in continual daily denial of the message of Jesus Christ. Why am I talking about this and talking about how Abram knows where true blessing and true provision comes from? Because the source matters. Where we receive the blessing matters. Satan has a way. Jesus has a better way. Satan has a way for you to live your life. Jesus has a better way for you to live your life. Be careful in your lives what we attribute as God's blessing and God's provision. God is the source 
source of salvation. God is the source of all blessing and provision. Now y'all get this. This is now, this is where we're getting down to the brass tacks. Y'all can understand this. Visa, MasterCard, and American Express are not your provider. Amen. Oh dear heavens. And everyone that's quiet right now is possibly believing Visa, MasterCard, and American Express are not your provider. You're in an emergency today. Uh, can I have a credit line increase, please? Yeah. I just had a major flood in my house, and I'm a, yes, I don't like living in wetness. Uh, could you please give me a credit line increase? How many of us have ever been in that situation? Not the flood part, calling in for a credit line increase because we had an emergency within our lives. Okay, a couple of honest ones of you. I'm talking to you this morning, and I'm talking to me. There was a time in my life where I used to think that. I was a blood child of God, and I believed in the blessings of God. I was tithing, but you know what? I wasn't spending my money in a good, godly way. I was spending more than I was bringing in, and there is no possibility, no matter whose God you serve, you cannot spend more than you bring in. So many, no wonder so, so many people are screwed up. Church, oh, if you spend more than you bring in, I don't care how much you give to God, God will not honor stupidity. He forgives it a lot of times. He's merciful. He's gracious to us. But he doesn't go beyond the saying of common sense that the principles of God's word lays down for us. The slave is servant to the lender. It's a principle throughout God's word. And I used to believe that God would bless me through Visa or MasterCard. Have I used those things in emergencies? Yes. But looking back on it now, I see that they weren't actually blessings in my life, but were actually hindrances to what God was wanting to do in me and through me. And the best example I remember is this after. I remember I was going out to eat with some uh, people after church. And I know none of y'all have ever been in this situation. But I didn't know how much money I had left on my card. Uh, yeah. You ever get that feeling when you go up to the register and swipe the card and you don't know if it's going to go through or not? We've all been there. Or some of us have been there. Including me. And I went to, and I think we are eating we were eating at Kobe's Steakhouse there in Springfield, Missouri. And it was Sunday afternoon and I was sitting down and I, God, I don't want to be embarrassed. I hope I have enough money to pay for this. That was real smart, wasn't it? And I remember the bill, it's time for the bill to come. And I, I looked over and one of my professors from uh, CBC, uh, Dr. Richard Hammer, he's the head counsel or lawyer for all of the Assemblies of God. He writes the church and clergy tax guide, smartest man I've ever met in my life. About six foot five, plays a violin, also doesn't own a TV, read, types 150 words a minute. And crazy smart. And he comes up to me. He says, Joe, lunch is on me today. He hands me a $20 bill as he's walking out the restaurant. I've never told him that that moment impacted my life forever. Why? Because at that moment I realized God spoke to me. Don't you ever think that somebody else is your provider because I'm your provider. Now, should I have been eating out at Kobe Steakhouse on a Sunday when I didn't know how much money I had in my account? No, I shouldn't have been. It was stupid. But God has grace and mercy on us a lot of times, even when we're stupid. But you know what? If I would have done the next thing the next week, there's a good chance God wouldn't have provided a way for it. Why? Because we need to learn from what God wants us to learn. What am I saying? Church, true provision and true blessing comes from God. If it's God's will for your life, it's not just his will for your life, it's also God's will. Notice what I said. God's will, if it's God's will for you to do this, then guess what? It's God's will too. It said he's on the hook for it, not you. If God's calling you to do something, God is going to provide a way for you to do it. Yeah. Or else God might not be calling you to do it. Why? 
Because the word of God says it continually over and over again. I am Jehovah Jireh, your provider. It could it be that we're so Americanized that we forget how much God is our provider. Where the first thing we think of is what time does the bank open on Monday morning because I've got to go down there and I've got to get a loan. The church, I'm telling you, that's normally the first thought in my mind too. You know, if there's emergency in your life, what's the first thing you think of? Me as a provider of my family, I try to think, how in the world am I going? Let's see, what can I do here? I've got this much money here. I've got, uh, we could charge it here. We could float this one for a month or two. Uh, we could go down to the bank and we could probably get a loan. <laughs> that's how we naturally think. But that's not how God operates within our life. We're so Americanized to this culture instead of getting on our face before God and pleading before him, God, we need your help. We try to do it our own way and we end up messing up not just things in our life, but things in people's lives around us. Church, God is my provider. Am I perfect in this? No, I'm not. I'm learning just like you are. But can I encourage you this morning, don't ever look a blessing from the world as a blessing from God. Be like Abram and say, I know where my blessing and my provision comes from. My provision comes from God. Sweetheart, would you come this morning, please? I believe that all provision, all true blessing comes from from God. And the last question I want to ask us this morning is, who is your source this morning? Who is your source this morning? For salvation, there's salvation in none other than Jesus Christ. There's salvation in none other. What is your source this morning for life difficulties and problems? There's only one source you can go to and find peace and find rest. Church, God is my source. He's my help. He's the only one that's always there that cares and wants to do something about it. Church, aren't you glad God rescues us from our own situations that we make for ourselves. You know, I think of, the more I read this story, the more, you know, I like to think I'm more like Abram, but the more I look at this story, I find myself being a lot more like Lot. And I think if you'll be honest with yourself, you'll see your life in Lot's life as well by thinking the situation you're in might be because of decisions you made of your own making. And instead of being the one who comes in and rescues, you find yourself being the one who's in need of rescuing. And as a man, I don't like to admit that needing to be rescued. I don't like that. That goes counterculture with everything that is ingrained within American male. But this is one point that counteracts what God wants to do in our life. Church, you know that God wants to deliver you. He wants to be your rescuer. That doesn't mean we go out and do stupid things in order for God to rescue us. You already do enough stupid things already. We do. The Bible says, should we go on sinning that grace may abound? God
rescuer instead of one who needs to be rescued. I wasn't thinking about that until just right now. But church, I believe that God wants us to move from rescued to rescuer. That means I believe God wants us to be instruments through which God uses you and me to rescue others out of those situations that we used to just be in. Honey, I was you two years ago. Why do you think you go through all this stuff? So that you can be a witness with somebody else who's going through that. Because don't nobody know anything else about it like you do. Why? Because you've been through it, you've conquered it, you've seen it, and you've done it.
are strength. And you are a rescue. Because you have done it in our lives. God, true blessing comes from you. We acknowledge you this morning. We acknowledge that fact this morning. God, help your creation to honor and worship you. Trust you this morning.